All right, so we're going to do these medical um, causes of behavior problems, and I'm told I have an hour and a quarter, a little bit quicker than the usual um, one, and that should be enough. Uh, but I think it's really important, you know, and when um, we're teaching uh, veterinary students, we teach them about the MRI machine, you know, and no one's going to use an MRI in their practice. Nobody can afford to buy one, I and mean, they're not going to actually be doing it, you know, but they need to know it exists. So they need to know when they reach the end of the line that they, they can refer. And so I'm not expecting you to go out and practice medicine. You're not really allowed to do it. But the fact is you need to be able to see these curveballs, knuckleballs coming. I mean, you could waste a lot of valuable time trying to train a dog uphill in the face of a medical problem, which means that you, know, you have sometimes no chance, and other times the odds are stacked against you. And you need to just turn that little screw and fix the medical problem. So first we're going to talk about hypothyroidism, and I'm not really interested in the classical veterinary diagnosis because it's old hat. Everybody knows about it. Here's a suspect, you know, overweight, um, sleeping a lot, not much, you know, joy in life, not wanting to go on walks, heat seeking, physical signs, slow heart rate, thin skin, um, hairs falling out, like the first dog I mentioned bald spots, you know, it's an endocrine disaster. You can diagnose this, this particular syndrome from the top of a double-decker bus with a telescope turned the wrong side, wrong way around. You know, it's, not, it's not rocket science. But there is a condition, and a lot of people don't understand this, there's oftentimes conditions that are, they're not the obvious full-blown diagnosis, but they're not normal. And it certainly happens in humans, and it does happen in dogs, I believe. And that is, there is a syndrome of what they call borderline or sub-threshold hypothyroidism. I heard a woman on NPR the other day who had been diagnosed with it, and she had an interesting sign. Um, and she said, I went to my MD doctor, and he pulled, because I wasn't feeling right, he pulled a thyroid panel, and he told me it was all within normal limits. But I still kept feeling bad, so eventually I went to see an endocrinologist, and he did a separate test, and he said, you have sub-threshold like borderline, hypothyroid, halfway between the full-blown. You've got this problem. Treated me, and she said, I felt so much better, and I got my memory back. She said, I kept losing stuff. I'd lose my car keys, I'd lose this and lose that. So, you know, there are cognitive effects of having a borderline low thyroid problem, one of which I think is increased anxiety. So, in answer to the question, what is canine cognitive dysfunction or canine Alzheimer's, it's an age-related deterioration in cognitive abilities. And it is not the same as just getting old. Just like, you know, as we get old, you know, there are old people who are 95 who are out there playing bowls or doing whatever they're doing or doing arts. Some people learning a new language or taking up bow hunting or something. And there's people doing all kinds of things, restoring churches and organs and painting. And other people are gaga. Uh, and the older you get, the more likely you are to fall into this gaga uh, classification. And there are brain changes that occur that you can actually see under a microscope in a human and in a dog, and the amount of pathology present in the brain correlates directly with the clinical sign severity. <clears throat> now, another thing which we're trying to quantitate, they used to be very uh, popular back in the 60s, you know, lots of problems were misdiagnosed or diagnosed or misdiagnosed as seizures, but we believe that there are conditions right out there right now that are being misdiagnosed. If you consider that in human beings, partial seizures, where you don't lose consciousness, you just have altered perceptions and strange moods, and you sense weird things and auras and tinglings and ringings and you know, weird stuff going on in bouts, is actually more common than what you know as epilepsy. You know, the grand mal falling down on the ground, having a seizure and salivating. Partial seizures in the human animal are more common than what we call seizures, the, the grand mal. Everything I've ever looked at in dogs has been parallel to what happens in humans, you know, with a few different tweaks here and there.